the 30th anniversary from when Wynn Schwartow said electronic Pearl Harbor to Congress in June of 1991. Right? Uh -huh. So we've been worrying about this large scale attack. We know, especially those of you in your side of the business that are handling the cyber physical, that we are open to these kinds of large scale disruptions. And yet mm -hmm. states have, none of them have chosen to, cro to cross that line. That's gonna be causing death and destruction, right? This is very exciting. Hi, I'm Dale Peterson, and welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. My guest today is Jason Healy. He is a senior research scholar at Columbia University School for International and Public Affairs, specializing in cyber conflict and risk. Jay started his career at the U.S. Air Force Intelli as an U.S. Air Force intelligence officer before moving to cyber response and policy jobs at the White House and Goldman Sachs. He was also the founding director for cyber issues at the Atlantic Council, where he remains a senior fellow, and he writes all the time. If I listed all the things he's written, we'd be here all, <laughs> we'd be talking about it the whole time. Uh, so welcome to the show, Jay. Thank you very much. Good to see you. You know, I could have you on this show probably every month on the interesting things that you write about, but I try to pick my spots when I ask you uh, to come on. And you wrote an article, and I'm not sure when it came out. I saw it in June, but it was the escalation, inversion, and other oddities of situational cyber stability. And you wrote that with Robert Jervis. And it really got my attention. I thought we'd maybe talk a little bit about cyber escalation or escalation due to cyber. But before we get there, one of the things that you've been covering and is sort of a, I'd almost say like an amateur in this mm. field, because it's a related field to what a lot of my listeners do. We focus on ICS security, and this is international relations, policy and such. But one of the topics that keeps coming up is this idea of cyber norms about the, the global participants agreeing that these are the things that you can do in cyber under these types of conflict situations. These are the things that you don't do and everyone agreeing on that. And the fact that at this point we don't seem to have them and that's a big issue with people. I was wondering from a historical perspective because you study conflict, how did some of the other areas get to norms, like chemical weapons norms or biological weapons war or, or air bombing norms? How, mm -hmm. how can we expect cyber norms to come about eventually? Usually it's a, some mix of horror and time past, right? Of, of governments saying, oh my gosh, look at what has happened from, from unrestrained aerial bombardment or what happened in the trenches of World War I or what happened when we allowed these, uh, these new kinds of arms or these old kinds of behaviors to come about. And often it took non-states to help that along. We can mo most, most clearly groups like the, the International Committee of the Red Cross Right, and, and people to come in and say, look, we've got to do better of taking care of wounded. We've got to do better in taking care of combatants, right? And so we, we do, war is hell, but we can make it a little bit less hellish, especially if we get everyone to agree. And so there is, a, of course, states at the center of that for the way that we think about normal war. Um, but there has always been, or, well, there has been this role for non-states. Has there been, maybe cyber is unique this way, but has there been norms related to what you could do in terms of conflict when there has not been declared or even, let's ah. say, it not necessarily a declared war, but where everyone agrees they're under conflict and that's one set of rules, but let's say you're not in an active conflict, are there norms in those other areas then, or is it just you don't do it unless there's conflict? There are, there are norms. Um, now, most of what we think about for war mm -hmm. is in the terms of the lawyers, um, international armed conflict, right? The Geneva Convention, uh, um, mm -hmm. things like that on how you treat um, actual combatants in the war. And so if you're below that line, which is somewhere around death and destruction, right? Of, of, you know, decently scaled death and destruction. Below that, 
Well, there are norms around uh, other kinds of uses of force that don't rise to that level. Um, and this is even in the, the UN Charter and things that states can do if you feel that someone has done this against you. And this could include lots of kinds of cyber activities uh, and what you're permitted to, to do back. Uh, the, the lawyers call it retorsions, but it's kind of an, it's kind of an odd word. Mm. And then below that, there's all sorts of unpleasant thing that states do to one another that um, there are still might be norms around, but that are more accepted. For example, sanctions or um, immigration controls. Like we're not going to let, um, you know, uh, Russian mafia members into the United States. We're not going to give them a visa if we think that their money was from ill-gotten gains. Or mm -hmm. of the biggest example of that is espionage. Right? States do it, and we might try and put some boundaries around what might be acceptable and unacceptable. And that's well below the level of armed conflict. I guess one of the words you mentioned almost at the beginning of your first answer was horror. <laughs> and that's that's a little bit uh, terrifying, of course. Horror is terrifying uh, that we might have to experience that before we reach norms. Is right. Nuclear might be the only case. And even then, there were there was a horror in Japan from nuclear. But... Other than that, have there been examples where we've reached norms without having to experience the horror? I would say space is probably the best example, right? Space was just so transformative and different that that states uh, came out with norms beforehand about how you could use space. Um, the moon, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we said you can't be messing around on the moon before anyone could really get to the moon. And so, so it is possible. Now, I'll push back a little bit on your, your something you said at the beginning, is we mm -hmm. do have norms for cyber. Right? We've actually got pretty solid norms across a range of areas. They're just selective. They're not everywhere that we would want them. And they're not always appreciated or lived up to by those that have signed up to those norms. But that's a different problem from not having any. Yes, and I've argued that side of it before. To me, I, I treat it like brand. Like You have a brand whether you know it or not. <laughs> right. When someone thinks of a, a company or a person, something immediately pops in their mind, and that's the brand. So there, there are cyber norms. I think, though, it's like an ill-defined brand that the norms might be varying greatly amongst the participants. Well, let me give I mean, there. There's one where we we're all in agreement on to a large degree, and that is you don't cause cyber attacks that go above that level of death and destruction. And and no one has done that yet. We've been talking about a cyber Pearl Harbor, electronic Pearl Harbor. As a matter of fact, we just hit the 30th anniversary from when Win Schwartow said electronic Pearl Harbor to Congress in June of 1991. Right? Uh -huh. So we've been worrying about this large scale attack. We know, especially those of you in your side of the business that are handling the cyber physical, that we are open to these kinds of large scale disruptions. And yet mm -hmm. states have, none of them have chosen to, cro to cross that line. That's mm -hmm. gonna be causing death and destruction. Right? Those that have like Stuxnet um, uh, crossed the line, but it was very tailored to, to not cause that horror that we were talking about. And so I think that's a very strong norm and one that we need to respect and say, we have this norm. Let's absolutely make sure we're not crossing that line accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, and there are further norms. Um, it's been incredible, um, say, six weeks at the United Nations because two separate groups, one that was a U.S.-led group and one that was a Russia-led group or inspired group, initiated group both agreed to, to norms that came out of a UN process in 2015. And so 25, 20 to 25 states agreed to those norms in 2015. And you just had a select group of 25 countries sign up to those norms and the UN as a whole, the 192, 193 countries all said, yes, these are, these are the norms. How does that square, though, with this defend forward concept and with the mm. quotations that we've had from, I don't know if I saw them from the Trump 
administration, but past Biden administration officials when they were challenged in some of the books that have come out recently to say, like Tom Bossert and others, to say, hey, don't you think we should say you can't attack critical infrastructure? Don't you think we should all agree on that? They say, I, I don't know about that. I don't think we want to take that off the table. We want to have that possibility in our arsenal. So how can you have these cyber norms on one hand, supposedly in these agreements that signed, I, I, I take you, you know, I haven't followed that. I take you at your word that those have actually happened and are signed. But on the other hand, you have people saying, hey, we're going to go into other countries and do things if we think it's in our national interest to do it. Well, well to, and just, just so I can complete the thought, those two UN processes were called the UN Open-Ended Working Group okay. and the UN Group of Government Experts. So if listeners want to fo uh, follow up, they can, they can take a mm -hmm. look. And so what I'm sure many listeners will say is, well, it's nice that we have the norms, but who cares if there's no enforcement? Where's the, where's the accountability? And so we can get to the accountability in a second. You're hitting the yes, but this is stuff that we want to do, that the United States might want yeah. to do as well. And so, for example, critical infrastructure, like clearly Iranian <laughs> nuclear enrichment, they would consider that part of their critical in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, the United States, it was reported in um, the New York Times and other sources, had mm -hmm. gotten into the Russian electrical grid. Um, it, just as the Russians and Chinese had been, had been in ours. But we didn't disrupt those. And so um, once some of those norms were, were written to be saying, OK, we're not talking about armed conflict, international armed conflict, right? If you're at war, then different rules apply. And yeah, mm -hmm. sure, you can go after, you can go after um, uh, the, their electrical grid, just like you would with, uh, with bombs or with carbon fiber or with, um, with, electromagnetic, with electromagnetic pulses. So one is, I think you're talking about the scale of the disruption. Right, when the United States and the other like-minded states, um, like-minded is the term for the United States, Britain, France, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, mm -hmm. Netherlands, the list goes on. There's probably about 25 of them. That if they were going to do off, uh, an offensive action that affected uh, critical infrastructure, especially physical critical infrastructure, that they would do so exceptionally carefully in a way that's making sure that it's not going to, to cascade um, that it is following all sorts of rules. Uh, the United States said early on that um, the Geneva Convention, the International Humanitarian Law, all these other rules apply. And um, that's one way, I, it was Dick Clark that said one way that we knew Stuxnet was the United States because you could tell lawyers were involved in it. Hmm. And I normally don't talk about Stuxnet this, this much, but it is, it is very yeah. germane to this kind of conversation. And you compare that, that caution that the like-minded countries take in this compared to um, not Petya, Wanna Cry, um, the, the Chinese hafnium intrusions into Microsoft Office that uh, was incredibly reckless, brazen, careless. Um, and you might think the United States overreaches, for example, on espionage, but our attacks that have caused any kind of physical impact have been um, rare and quite limited. Mm. Restrained would actually be the word that I'd prefer to use. I could take that down about five different paths, but I want to <laughs> jump to your article because I think it is related it's to... It's a nice connection, yeah. Yeah, because your article tries to an answer the question, are cyber capabilities escalatory? Can we you know, be doing something in cyber that then all of a sudden turns into a much larger conflict? Uh, First of all, I guess the first question is, are there people that say no to that? Are there, is there a side of the equation that says, no, as a rule, they won't be escalatory? There's a very strong in, um, argument that cyber capabilities aren't escalatory. And frankly, they've got, for the way they define it, they have the evidence on their side. And they actually convinced me about it. Um, I'd always been... Um, of saying, look, how they, they argue, how can you say the use of cyber capabilities is, is escalatory when it's never escalated meaningfully out of cyberspace? Well, that's and, the Richard. That's the Richard Clark. It's never happened before, and and we are very familiar with that in the ICS world. There's a lot of things that happen haven't happened in cyber physical attacks that. Right. Yeah, quite frankly, is the reason why a lot of us do what we do. So I, I understand that argument. Now, in your paper, you had four categories, though. 
Right. Of, I, so, uh, and, well, and three of them were escalatory, <laughs> right? <laughs> or and, destabilizing. And let me just say one more point on, on sure. their argument. Um, there, there's one... There's one say that was like it never does, and then uh, some others have auto offered some explanations for it. Mm -hmm. One say um, because it's it's an intelligence contest, and states generally are treating this like like it's spying, and you never try and win an intelligence. Contest. You might be winning, mm -hmm. but you're never going to actually win. And um, and some of them say, look, cyber gets used by states as a pressure release. Like, look, when the Iranians shot down one of our drones and were, and were um, putting limpet mines on tankers in the Gulf, President Trump called off the airstrike because he did, it was going to kill perhaps up to 150 people, but he allowed the cyber to go through, and then both sides were able to say, good, we're done. Right? So it's that mm -hmm. pressure release, which I think is a really strong argument. And so, but what we've done is to, to take how you framed this, is cyber, in general, when we're talking about cyber capabilities... Mm -hmm. We shouldn't say, are they X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. in this case, escalatory. It's better to ask, under what conditions are they? And so that's what the paper does. And it's saying this lived experience of those of us in the field, which is, oh, my God, every year is freaking worse than the last one. Right? How mm -hmm. can you say it doesn't escalate when all of us would gladly have the issues that we had last year or five years ago or 20 years ago? Because we're seeing this in escalation within the internet and cyber physical systems. You know, mm -hmm. stuff that we see nowadays, we never thought that things would get this bad 10 or 20 years ago. Surely we're, we'll stop the craziness before we get to there. We'll stop the horror. Um, don't we, I, you know, I compare it to the scene, uh, the gasoline fight scene in Zoolander. Right, you had these male models, and they're spraying each other with yeah. gasoline, and you're just sitting back and saying, "Oh my God, this is all going to blow up on our faces." Someone stop before it's too late. And those of us, especially on the cyber physical side, are saying they're not messing around; they're continuing to play this incredibly dangerous game. So we looked at these other scenarios, like under what conditions is cyber likely to escalate and no longer be this kind of pressure release. Well, and the pressure release was the first of the four mechanisms. It's the one that mm -hmm. you rated, you and your co-author rated as stabilizing. And I understand the point to that. We have a number of pressure release mechanisms pre-cyber, right? It could mm -hmm. all the way from sending ambassadors back to, <laughs> right. you know, all, all sorts of tit for tats to say sanctions. And you've mentioned a bunch of them. And cyber certainly would give you a large range, right? Because there's a large range of cyber activity. So you could scale your response, all of without causing death and destruction and things that would lead to what most people would consider active conflict. I, what's, what's the word actually that people use when it goes from just this tit for tat sort of thing to conflict? Is there a bright line there or is that, or is that just something? No one that knows, right? No one knows. Okay. Yeah, we don't well, know yet. Well, well, why don't you hit? Um, why don't you hit a couple of the other mechanisms? Yeah. So there were four others. So which one? Which is the most? Maybe of the three, which is the one that you think is going to be mm -hmm. most escalate or most destabilizing? Well, let's just say the conditions. We said, look, it's operating like a pressure release either when um, the it is just time of relative peace, mm -hmm. or neither one of the adversaries, the nation states involved, really wants to let things get out of hand. Mm. Right? And so that's the one that you can change first, right? Of saying, um, well, we're starting to see more crisis and conflict between major states, Russia, United States, China, especially, um, but, not, but, but not just like China and India, for example. And so we could anticipate that as we see the chance of conflict rise, that they're going to be more risk taking when it comes to cyber, that they're no longer going to be willing to say, um, you know what, cyber is just a pressure release, that, that they're going to say, you know what, um, I don't want a pressure release. I want to increase the goddamn pressure on you and I'm going to use cyber as one of the ways that I'm going to do it. Because people that said it operates as a pressure release, they're looking back at a period from the beginning, the end of the Cold War to now, where there's generally been a decrease in all kinds of armed conflict. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we're not seeing it in cyber 
doesn't require an explanation because we're not seeing it in any other domains either. Well, it's funny when you're talking about the press pressure release there, you could have cyber acting as a pressure release and just not be an effective pressure release. <laughs> right, right? Just, right, because, right. just because cyber is followed by conflict didn't mean that cyber was the escalation clause. It just meant it wasn't sufficient to prevent this train that was leaving the station anyways. And it Absolutely. just wasn't enough of a pressure release. Now, what about some of the other mechanisms, though, where you see it actually being used? You have spark, pull out the big guns, and escalation inversion. Yeah. So the one I just talked about was the pull out the big guns. That is, you're seeing more crises, states might. But let's just take that. Like the, the scenario we had just said, where a state is saying, hey, you know what, this is, gonna, this is good. This will be a pressure release. Well, what if the other state doesn't see it as a pressure release? Mm. Right? Imagine after the United States killed Soleimani. Um, you know, the head of the, the, sure. um, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. What if the Iranians would have said, all right, we're going to do a, a, you know, a decent sized cyber attack on the United States, hitting critical infrastructure. But that's okay. It's a pressure release, right? We, you know, we Iranians, we feel like we really could be shedding a lot of American blood right now. So I'm, but we're going to say no to the hardliners that want real terrorist attacks, real terrorist attacks. And instead, we're going to do this virtual thing because it's going to be pressure release, right? America might not take that as a pressure release, right? Mm -hmm. We might we might say, oh, ho, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, and so uh, in what we call the uh, spark is that as we're becoming more and more, as all states are becoming more and more dependent on the Internet, and especially the cyber physical systems, uh, we're now starting to, it's more likely that other states are becoming Hitting, getting closer to core national interests. And when you're getting in closer to core national interest, then states, again, might say, no, no, enough is enough. You've gone too far, and you're going to have to suffer from it. And so in this one, the crisis is starting within the Internet. In the last one that we called the escalation inversion, um, and we called it escalation inversion because it flips the narrative of the, of the pressure release that some of the dynamics of cyber conflict that encourage it to be a pressure release. It can be reversible, it can be hard to attribute, it can be um, uh, the, the, all the rest. If a state thinks another that, that war is likely, then you wanna get your cyber punch in early. Even, even if you're not even sure, like imagine that you had to go to war with the United States. Mm -hmm. You think you might have to. And you know the United States as a boxer with this incredible right hook, incredibly powerful offense, both in, in cyberspace, in the internet, and everywhere else. But you know they're really weak. They've got a glass nose when it comes to cyber physical systems mm -hmm. and the internet. You're not going to wait until the bell rings and the match starts. You're going to get your sucker punch in beforehand if you think war is potentially likely anyhow. Yeah, we've seen examples of that. I think uh, I did a talk a few years ago in Europe where, on this idea of preceding World War One. that that idea of the cult of the offensive was there, mm -hmm. that whoever hit first was going to win, so you had to hit first, hit hard, because you couldn't defend, and, and that was it. And that, that was a very destabil destabilizing time or destabilizing school of thought because of that. And I guess your example, what you were just talking about, you could point to the Japanese in, in World War II. Absolutely. They thought World War, it was inevitable and it was going to happen. Where do you think we are today in terms of in terms of cyber on that? Do some people think it's inevitable? So I guess you can't, we can't probably look, maybe that's the mistake that I make and a lot of people make. You can't look at cyber without looking at all the other types of conflict, right? It, it's, it's just not going to be a standalone cyber conflict if it really becomes a true conflict. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, we're in the hellish quadrant, right? Um, you know, if you imagine, you know, that one axis is um, geo state of geopolitical conflict, high and low, and then you have um, state of cyber competition, increasing and decreasing, high and low, increasing and de mm -hmm. decreasing, right? We're, we're, we're pretty clearly, um, you know, um, for decades, we've been going in the increasing cyber competition, mm -hmm. also increasing cyber dependence, 
Yes. Um, and and um, and fragility. Um, and especially since you know, especially called 2014 when the Russians invaded Crimea, we're now in a, this new phase of great power competition. So we're seeing the increase. So it certainly makes it look like uh, across all three of our um, scenarios that we consider destabilizing, that now likely to be fighting over in, more increasingly existential things within cyberspace, more crises generally, and more states feeling like there is a potential that things are going to get out of hand and lead to war, in which case they need to get their cyber attack in early. Mm. Let me hit one last area, and this is an area I, I tend to know a little bit more about because it's the actual attacks. <laughs> but right. if I, what I have contended and I feel pretty confident in is that if if let's say I was in the government and I and my boss has said to me, we need to be able to take out the power. We need to take out this critical manufacturing capability. We may need to do it against these potential adversaries. You need to be prepared to do that. If if I get that as as a potential tasking, that may take me three to six months to do. So I have to find a way to get in. I have to get in. I have to pre-stage my tack. I have to do all this work without necessarily ever actually launching that attack just like you build munitions and ships and everything else but in this case i'm doing it in their country on their critical systems how is that and i gotta believe that's happening every day now because i gotta believe these people are getting the tasking and they're not gonna answer the call when they say we need to be able to do this say okay we'll we'll be able to do it in six months I mean, <laughs> that answer isn't going to go over very well how does that planning and preparation and pre-staging issue in another person's territory on another person's system add or, or subtract to this issue? Well, I think you're leading up to it, right? It's, it's, it's going to make you feel worse, right? And if you're already starting to heighten your alert status because you think conflict is getting ready, is likely with another state, and then you see them starting to muck around in the, in the systems, then... Um, uh, it's going to lead you, they might just be doing it as routine preparation, um, but the observable things that you have make you feel like they're they're cocking their hand back, um, or even worse, pulling the knife back, ready to thrust it forward, um, when all it was meant to be was intelligence or, you know, some target preparation. And so, yeah, that's, that, that is, uh, I think, pretty significant. Do you think that this can ever get, though, to the position of espionage? Because in espionage, there's there's a tacit agreement now that we spy on mm -hmm. you and you spy on us. And and as long as you don't cross this line, then or even if you do cross this line, we'll only cross it this much. Again, the norms issue. But do you think that that type of preparation and pre-staging can be tied more to the espionage school as opposed to the weapon school or is that oh, we can we could try it as much as we oh, well as you know it's part of it's going to be target related right i'm sure mm -hmm. you, you know your listeners would be able to know if this is a system that's likely to lead to espionage or like if is it likely to lead to interesting espionage right well i guess i'm not saying espionage the purpose would not be espionage mm -hmm. but treated like there's a certain acceptance that espionage takes place is do you think we'll get to the point where there's a certain acceptance that your adversaries are going to try to get a position in your network, and that doesn't mean that they're about to attack you. For example, if we found the Chinese widespread across a lot of generation plants in the United States, would be that that be something that would they shrug their shoulders because they say, "Hey, we're trying to do the same thing to them. This is this is the world we live in." Or is that decades away from that kind of feeling? Boy, I mean, it sounds like you're describing the last couple of decades. Um, to me, right? I mean, we've well certainly the last decade, right? I mean, we've we've known that others have been getting access into our systems. We assume the United States is doing um, getting into their systems, and it doesn't seem like either side particularly wants to to call it out or make a big too big a deal about it. So, it almost sounds like that's where we are now. I guess you're right because that certainly has been true in government systems. It hasn't been terribly true in mm -hmm. in critical okay. infrastructure systems. They've gotten into the companies. But there hasn't been at least a lot of public evidence yet that they've gotten into the systems ready to, hey, let me shut this down. Mm -hmm. Although the U.S. seems to have had that capability in some smaller targets, at least. Yeah. But, I, I, uh, certainly felt, 
I certainly sorry. I felt a lot better if if the EU and the United States would have made more more of a big deal about Ukrainian electrical grid, right? Yeah. But everyone was pretty silent about that, right? That would have been a seems like a fine opportunity to come out. Um, and for norms, right? And to say norms. Yeah. And by the way, I think COVID, we we really missed an opportunity. Um, you know, when this started breaking in, I think, April or May of 2020, I wrote a piece of saying we need the attorney general and the ministers of interior of the EU to come out and say, if you're doing ransomware against the hospital, we are going to be prosecuting you for manslaughter. We're going to do everything we can. Mm. Um, and we could have really come out very strongly about that. It's like, like, you know, like hey, if you're going to spy on a, a, um, a vaccine, we can kind of look the other way if it's merely spying on the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to mess with the vaccine in any way, shape, or form, then that's going to be um, something that's going to get uh, exceptionally strong retaliation. And we never really did that in, in any mm -hmm. kind of coordinated or strenuous way. And so it's, it's, it's disappointing. I never thought of that. That would That is an opportunity missed. Uh, well, Jay, I appreciate you being on the show. If people want to find your stuff, read your stuff, uh, we have your Twitter handle up there, at Jason underscore Healy. Uh, where else can they find you online? You know what? Almost everything I've published is on LinkedIn, and that will have a ton, that'll have a ton of the stuff on the LinkedIn. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being Great. on the show, Jay. Thank you, Dave.